Today, instead of covering just one topic, I'm going to be answering your questions. I've gotten tons of emails with your questions and topics you'd like me to cover, and although many of these could be a full video, I didn't want to have to wait to address them. I've gotten so many questions that this will definitely be a recurring series, so if you don't see your question here today, keep an eye out and it will be coming soon. Today we're talking about all things autoimmune blood testing. What is seronegative autoimmune disease? How can you lower or change an autoantibody test result? And what you should do if a test result comes back sky high. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz, and this is Connected Rheumatology. Let's get started. Okay, so what is seronegative autoimmune disease? The term seronegative, with sero meaning blood and negative meaning, well, negative, simply means that your autoantibody blood test return negative. There are many types of seronegative autoimmune diseases. Some conditions are always seronegative, such as psoriatic arthritis, and some can be either seropositive or seronegative, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Being seronegative is neither good nor bad, generally. Why would an autoimmune disease be seronegative? Well, there are a few reasons. First, it could be that the level of autoantibodies in someone's bloodstream is simply too low to be picked up by testing. This could be the result of low production, as is the case with generally weakened immune systems or organ dysfunctions, such as liver failure. But keep in mind, both of these scenarios is obvious to the treating doctor right away. It's easy to assume that an undetectable antibody level must mean that the condition is mild. So mild, in fact, that you can't even pick up the autoantibody on a blood test. And although this may be the case sometimes, it's not always. In fact, I've had cases of such severe lupus, and I'm talking ICU level of severe, that the ANA is undetectable because of the level of inflammation going on. To be fair, that's more the exception than the rule, but it shows that this is no one size fits all. And secondly, it may be that we simply aren't smart enough yet to know which autoantibody to test and how to reliably test for it. This is something that is improving every day. Take the example of rheumatoid arthritis. For years, the only antibody test we had for RA was the rheumatoid factor. This meant that a large number of people with RA were classified as seronegative if their rheumatoid factor was negative. When the CCP antibody came along, we found that in fact, many of those seronegative RA patients actually had the CCP antibody and weren't seronegative after all. We just didn't know about it. How do you make a diagnosis of seronegative autoimmune disease if, by definition, there is no autoantibody to test for? Well, it's a good question. It takes patience, persistence, and time. Making a seronegative autoimmune diagnosis can be tricky as the lack of positive blood tests can lead to false diagnosis or a delay in diagnosis. It becomes a diagnosis of exclusion, which means you and your doc will need to thoroughly go down the list of other possibilities before settling on a seronegative diagnosis. How can we lower or change an autoantibody test result? I get this question all the time. None of us like to have a bolded abnormal result on our test results sheet. So of course we want to know what we can do to get that bolded abnormal to be back in the normal range. But in general, this really isn't our goal. We don't treat blood test results. We treat humans like you. I only care about the test results in so much that it tells me about you. But of course, there's nuance to this and our approach is dependent on both the test we're talking about and the autoimmune condition we're dealing with. So what do I mean? Well, let's look at two different examples. Jane has rheumatoid arthritis and a positive rheumatoid factor. She's doing very well on her treatment and her doctor has even said she's in remission. Well, Jane ends up seeing a new primary care doctor and a rheumatoid factor is done and found to be positive. Should she do something about it? Well, let's think through this. The first question I would suggest Jane discuss with her doctor is, does this elevated rheumatoid factor tell us anything about my health today or in the future that we don't already know? In this case, unless the rheumatoid factor was off the charts, the answer is no. It likely doesn't tell us anything new. Okay, the next question I'd recommend asking is, how would you even go about trying to get that number down? 
And to that, the best evidence-based answer is with medications. But as you know, medications don't come without a potential risk. So if the positive rheumatoid factor doesn't tell Jane something new and she's already in remission, why take on the potential risk of a new medication? So see, we don't want to attack all abnormal test results just because they are abnormal. But there are cases where an abnormal test result can lead us to want and need more information. So here's another example. Judy has lupus. She's been doing okay with her medications, but is still not out of the woods yet. As part of her routine checkup, she has a double-stranded DNA antibody tested, or a DSDNA antibody. The DSDNA result has been positive since she was diagnosed, but it has been going down as her symptoms have improved. So everyone has generally been feeling encouraged. Well, the result today is back and it's up. It's way up. And Judy's shocked because she doesn't feel any different. So does she need to do anything about it? Well, let's go back to our original question. Does this elevated DSDNA tell Judy anything about her health today or in the future that she didn't already know? In this case, because the DSDNA is so closely tied to lupus in the kidneys, something that cannot have any symptoms in the beginning, the answer is yes, this DSDNA result potentially does tell her something new. The next step isn't necessarily to throw all kinds of new medications at it, but to dig a little deeper. If she finds her kidneys are in fact impacted, that would be a reason to take on the risk of a new medication. So you can see how the particular antibody and condition influences the response to an abnormal test result. But it's not about the result. It's about what the result is potentially telling us. And keep in mind that in both of these examples, both Jane and Judy already had a diagnosed condition. In those that don't yet have a diagnosis, it can be a little less clear cut. As you could argue, the abnormal result is pointing towards a diagnosis. But I, again, will highlight, it's not about the test result, but how the result may or may not fit into context of your symptoms. This leads to another very common scenario. What if you have an autoantibody result that is sky high and doesn't really correlate with how you're feeling. So this is a surprising result. When surprising results come up, I find it's helpful to first go back to the original reason the test was run in the first place. Presumably something was going on that led to the testing. So let's use the centromere antibody as an example. The centromere antibody is an antibody that is classically associated with Crest syndrome, which is a type of systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. So you can ask, are you having symptoms that are typically seen in those with Crest? In cases of surprising results, it usually doesn't lead to an immediate diagnosis, but to more testing. But how do you know how much testing is enough? It's very easy to go down the testing rabbit hole and have every test known to man done. Aside from the expense and the bruising, it can be very confusing. This is where having a good dialogue with your doctor is key. Discuss what conditions your surprising result is associated with and what tests will bring you closer to understanding your risk for those conditions. In the case of a surprising centromere antibody test, this may mean testing for the lung and heart issues that can arise from Crest syndrome. Obviously, I'm speaking in general terms, and the specific test that should or shouldn't be pursued is between you and your doctor. What I always find helpful in these scenarios is to understand what red flags you should look out for at home. If the further testing results in nothing to speak of, then you are often left with the plan to just watch it. I know this can be maddening because who wants a sky high result that you do nothing about? But with autoantibodies, sometimes it's just the way it is. And what does watching it even mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? It means you know what symptoms to look out for, and then you reach out to your doc if you start to see any. In the case of the centromere antibody result, possible red flag symptoms would be new or worsening Raynaud's phenomenon, new or worsening shortness of breath, fatigue, difficulty swallowing, or skin changes. Ask your doctor what are possible red flag symptoms you should keep an eye out for in relation to your surprising result. Throughout all of these questions, we've talked about how important having open and honest communication with your doctor is. I know it's easy to say and not always easy to facilitate in real life. There are a number 
of obstacles that can get in the way of a good conversation with your doctor. But I want to remind you that they may be the medical expert, but you are the expert of your own life. And if you have questions, suggestions, or ideas, you absolutely can and should bring them up. Thanks so much for emailing me your support and your questions. It means so much to know that this information is reaching those who are facing these tough circumstances. And I would love to hear more about how I can help you. I'd love it if you could like, subscribe, and share this. It really helps out, and we'll see you next time.